Okay. Okay, hello everyone and welcome, welcome. As usual, there was technical difficulties and we're still experiencing <laughs> some of those. Uh, you'll, you might hear a little audio buffering every now and then. I'm not sure why it's doing that today, but thankfully we can still hear us enough and you'll be able to hear about the journey that my friend Sean will be telling you about and we'll have some fun along the way. So sorry in advance for the weird audio quality, but thankfully I'm, uh, ready for technical difficulties to just always be a part of my streams. Oh, and yeah. I'm just used to it by now. Okay. So, uh, I guess as we start off, I'm sure since we're starting late, people are already joining us. Mm -hmm. I won't do a shout out thing because we'll jump right into this so that Sean can, you know, start talking about his interview questions. But officially, hi everyone, I'm Timothy Von Reden, better known as Von Art, and I'm joined today by my very special guest, Sean Price. Hello! Known to the online world as Art of Price, but debatable on if that will stay the same. <laughs> and today we're going to be interviewing him. And this is great because Sean and I used to do streams together, and he's one of my, kind of one of my oldest art friends, which sounds weird, but uh, we've known each other for like five, so? six years. I feel like Dee would be one of your oldest art friends. I mean, if she actually published art, yeah. <laughs> um, oh boy. <laughs> but no. Coming up on six years. Six years. Six years. And yeah, I met Sean at C2E2 six years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, uh -oh. Definitely not deal donated $1. Sean Price Price Sean. Sean, Sean Price Price Sean Price for C and Price PPP. CCCEE Sean Price. You're good to Holy moly, I didn't know that. Well, works. thank you, Definitely Not Digital. I know thank I you. added one of those, the voice that Noel Miller does. Yeah. I grabbed the same one. I thought it was, I think that voice is so oh, good. Oh, it's a good one. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Oh, and Alex is here too. Hi everyone. Uh, Jonathan, Lars, Drea. Hello, hello everyone. So I don't want to fill up the airtime with my voice, so I think I'm going to jump kind of right into it. But before we start asking you the questions, if you want to give a little background as to who you are, and I guess we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, well, like Tim said, I'm Sean Price. Uh, that is my name. And I go by Art of Price online, but like I said, debatable if that's going to stay. It's probably just going to be Sean Price. Um, but I, for old, you know, for people like old viewers and everything like that, I was here. We used to do these all the time with CG Cookie mm -hmm. and everything. And yeah, we used to just do, <laughs> we used to just do streams. I don't know if I did a very good job on them, <laughs> but, but yeah, they were great. But other than that, um, besides all that, before I met Tim, I was a tattoo artist. I was a tattoo artist for eight years. Um, I started when I was 18, directly out of high school, and I tattooed all the way till I was 26. Uh, and then after that, I wanted to be an illustrator. I went to C2E2, which was a, a convention out in Chicago, and I showed my stuff. I just had I had my little tiny sketchbook, and I showed Tim my stuff, and he's like, "Wow, he's like, you should really do this." Yeah. And then we stayed. Yeah, we stayed in touch. And then I think a year later, uh, I moved in. And then yeah, I very been, quick. Yeah, I've been doing this now. I've been doing art independently now for four years, five years now. So. Yeah, since I've known you, so five years. Yeah, I well, think. technically you're doing art before then, but I think going down the independent art mm -hmm. lane, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I was a tattoo artist for a very long time. It's a big part of my history, and it was a good time, but it wasn't, I didn't want to do it. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you were able to still take a lot of what you learned from tattooing and apply it to your current art. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like you can even see it, like, in all of my Especially art. Especially in your line weight. Yeah, I do, yeah. It's very specific in the line weight and shape language as well. I should also mention, I forgot to say, if any of you have any questions for Sean, if you want to ask them, put at Von Art so I can see it, and then I will add a little community section on the end of my interview questions, and then we'll get to all your questions at the end. So feel free to ask anything about Sean, if it's art or not art related, and he will do his best to answer them. Okay. Um, the cable where it connects with the mic. Fill with that. Oh. If that's actually the problem, me like fiddling with this little cord. Right. You know what? I think it actually connects back here. All right, maybe, hopefully that will work. Can you take out one of these fancy new IMAX that got the colors on them? It's a good time. And of course, it's something wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and of course, it, something, yeah. it doesn't have USB anymore. So even this oh, cord is, is going to a USB to USC, and then, then it plugs uh, in. So maybe that's part of the problem. Be silly. Yeah, so I'll probably do, do you have a dongle for it. Yeah. Oh well, that might be it. Maybe. Maybe. I wish that 
we'll, we'll, it was an ads. We'll see. Okay, so to start off, uh, we're going to go through each one, like I said, and then Sean's going to take over and show you on the other screen his art from years ago, and we'll go from there. So, first question, Sean Price, and these are questions I ask every artist. Growing up, when did art seem to grab your attention? I know the exact moment, and really? I do, I know the exact moment when I wanted to be an artist. And I was in third grade, and there was a kid, I won't name him, I won't put out actual names out of there, but there was a kid, and they sent him to an art class. Like, they sent him, like, an art class over the summer, so he did, like, an art thing over the summer, and then he came back. And I remember we had all art class together, and, like, everybody, this is, like, when Pokemon was big, and, like, I was drawing Pikachu, I was drawing Garfield, like, I was knocking them all out. And then, in art class... He shows up and he ends up like drawing this like beautiful like pyramid. I don't even know. It probably looks still beautiful to me now if I seen it. But he drew this. Like an Egypt one? Yeah, yeah. And he drew these like beautiful like pyramids and everything like that. And the teacher took his work and like put it on the front of the class and was like and was like, this is amazing. Like all of you should really strive to like do this type of work. Like this is great. This is wonderful and everything. And I was so jealous i was so jealous because i wanted to be considered <laughs> i wanted to be considered like the artist of the of the thing but i wasn't and he was the one and he got it he got the award for being like best artist in the class and i really wanted it really bad uh, but i didn't get it and since then i remember like to that day i told myself as a kid i said i'm gonna be an artist that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna be an artist and i'm gonna be better than this kid and it stuck with me. It's funny, like, that stuck with me. And obviously, like, as I got older and started to learn, like, you know, like, I was just jealous and, and, and upset. Um, but I still really enjoyed art. I still loved, I drew on everything when I was a kid. I wanted to work with bands when I was a, when I was a teenager. And I just wanted to draw, like, I would just want to do their shirts for them. Or to do a bunch of, like, skateboards for them and everything. Yeah, like, art was always a big thing that I always gravitated to rather than anything else. It was just something that I used as to, like, to escape. You're, like, slowly sliding out of frame. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Like, every, you kept talking, like... <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm leaning. Yeah. I'm leaning. It's funny how much of an influence that has on kids, because mm -hmm. uh, I was just telling my parents uh, when I was in school, since the teacher always labeled me the best artist, my mind then, I think, was convinced that was the field I was going to go into, and there was no other path for me, and that was set rather young. Mm -hmm. So it's funny how much art becomes so influential to us as a kid and becomes the journey that we're put on, whether or not if that was meant to be our journey. We're just so convinced from outside influences. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yours was kind of the opposite of mine, where you felt like you were the second, and you had to like overcome the first to be the best in the class. Still trying. <laughs> Still trying to this day. <laughs> How's that going? Still second. <laughs> um, okay, so now, okay, let me merge all these first. Sure. And then I'm going to give you control to look at your old art here. Yeah. It's beautiful. Are <laughs> right, you ready? Yeah. So here we go. So I'm gonna, yeah, you take control of that. So yeah, so. Well, hold on, hold on. Oh, hold on. Question two. Can we see some work from three years ago, five, 10, 15, uh, if you have any, and then your current work? So I have stuff from high school and 10 years ago, and five, and then two years ago, and then now. Um, and the one that the one thing I have from high school is every you know I draw a lot of birds I really enjoy birds and one of the first birds that I drew was this beautiful bird. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> oh, here we can move yeah. it over. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, there it is. All right, so yeah, so this was one of the first things I drew, and I thought I was very good at it. And you know what's funny is I put this on Facebook, and I remember, this, this was like on MySpace and Facebook, and I remember like people commented on this, and they were like, wow, like, that's really good. And I didn't, I didn't really bug me. I was like, oh yeah, this is awesome. Um, and then I do drew some other things. I do this guy. What is this? He's just like a little monster guy coming out of like a ball. 
And you got some water coming out of them. You got like a halo thing with this wing. This was the signature wing that I put on everything. Mm -hmm. um, look at that texture. That's good. Uh, so yeah, really what it was is that I actually loved an artist named Greg Simpkins. Um, oh. Yeah, and then his name's Crayola. And he did these very like collage things. Uh, and... They were beautiful. They were beautiful, like, acrylic paintings. And I remember I just wanted to be like that. So I, like, gravitated that. And I just tried to just shove, like, all this stuff in that didn't make any sense. Like, this is gross. This is all gross. Just letting <laughs> this you know. This is all gross. This is all gross. But this is what I drew in high school, and you got to start somewhere. Honestly, you still have some pretty good shading in areas for high school. You have that occlusion shadow yeah. everywhere. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Um, there was this guy, too. He was a nice little. He was a nice little uh, jellyfish wizard. I don't know if I knew this nice little thing. <laughs> this had like the, everything had this weird like. I don't know if you've noticed this with like old art or artists like a little, maybe more amateur artists or just art, artists starting out. There's always like this kind of strange like shape, like shading to things and stuff like that. Yeah. It's always kind of it's it's one thing that you can always look out and the more you look at it and you can call it out and be like, oh, like you might need a little help in this area. Um, but well, yeah, especially in high school, like you don't really know what shading is or how to add value correctly. No, no, not at all. And and even now to this day, I still don't. <laughs> get out of here. Um, and so <laughs> get off my stream. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so yeah, and then I started I started a uh, apprenticeship, um, a tattoo apprenticeship, and so I really enjoyed um, new school style, uh, which what it was. It was very you know kind of big colors and big shapes and everything and that was kind of my thing that I'd like to do and so <laughs> I drew this and I would use colored pencils and I would just kind of throw whatever color was at it and I'd be like okay cool like here's this and we'll make this look like this and this looks like this um so this is a guy I liked him he was bomb bird more birds um these were zombie cherries that I ended up <laughs> drawing uh and I really wanted to tattoo them and I was obsessed for a long time I don't know if this had it on it no um yeah, oh, kind of. It's this rim light that you put on everything. Oh, yeah. Or it's like this, yeah. And I would put it on everything. So I'd put it like these yellow things like right here. All these guys, like, um, I thought I, I thought this was really good because I put, like, a definition over there. <laughs> and, like, you can just kind of see, like, the other side of well, it. It's funny how halloween -y this is and you didn't even like Halloween. Yeah, oh, yeah, there's this guy, too. <laughs> he was, like, super, like, Tim Burton-esque. Yeah, this is like Beetlejuice yeah. concept art. Yeah. <laughs> Beetlejuice concept art. I'm honored. Yeah, I'm honored. Um, but yeah, I was really just, I just threw whatever colors at it. And I always did this weird, like, thing right here where I did these, like, blood splots on it. Well, all the past ones had, like, these weird color Yeah, these behind. little splotchy things, yeah. Or, like, this little thing right here. I don't know, it just kind of filled up space. Same thing. Uh -huh. All that just filled up space. Um, so, yeah, so that was everything from 10 years ago. Uh, now, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, so from five years ago, I basically, this was from 2015. Uh, and this is after, you know, doing, I was already well into tattooing. I really enjoyed, I, this is when I found Corey Godby and Justin Gerard. And they were my two biggest, uh, two biggest influences at the time, or at least just people I've really, really looked up to of just being like, okay, like I want my work to be like that. And I really tried very hard to be as good as Justin Gerard because his pencil work and his shading and just how he like made everything was mm -hmm. and awesome. And also does his character stuff was great. Um, I still really enjoy this guy. I think he's wonderful. He's got a little band aid and his little, uh, his little America pants. It's a good time. And I still think those pants work because there's like these nice little folds in it. And it's just, he's right there. Um, these ones are more your, these ones are all Tim's favorites. I and love the green drawing. Yeah, the green drawings though, the more I kept looking into them, the more I kept seeing of just like, oh, like I just really, really push story. Um, oh yeah, sorry. No, that's my fault. I, uh, I pushed story, I pushed... That was the one thing you told me. You said with my green drawing, you mentioned that, like, I just went for it. I just made something. Everything was different. It wasn't just like, okay, like, you're just going to draw a bird. You're just going to do this. You're just going to, you know, do this blue and red thing or this really nice thing. You just kind of went for it. And there were things that I didn't understand, like composition. Like, things are kind of all over the place. Shading's kind of all over the place. But 
at the same time I developed a style of just being like the stylized shading to where it didn't really matter it just everything sat nice and looked nice with each other and I went for it and I pushed story and and for a long time as much as I pushed away my green drawings I very much enjoy them now like looking at them because it was purely what I wanted to do at that time especially like right when I was getting out of tattooing I thought to myself this is what an illustrator does uh, and I was like okay that's that's it um, this one's one of my all-time mm. favorites uh, so good yeah this is I had a really really good time with this one a lot I remember feeling really good about this one um, I thought that there was like so much story in it there was a lot of things like I loved drawing this little robot guy and just talking with this little mouse guy over here in this big junkyard. I had so much fun like going through and like adding like there's a refrigerator, this is a couch. Like I just wanted to make a junkyard um, as much as possible. And this guy right here, uh, so this guy's in a lot of things. So he always sticks in, every time I draw a robot, I try and stick him into a lot of things. Um, I don't know, I just like him, he's just a little bucket hand. But yeah, he, like all even all these little details in here and just like you said, I just went for it. Um, this one too, you're a big fan of. Uh, you were a big fan of this one specifically for the depth of it. Is that what you said? I love the branch work. I love the depth. I love the composition. I don't love the story that they're stealing a mom eggs, but <laughs> I loved, I think what, I, okay, so maybe a lot of you don't know this. Uh, if you're newer to these streets, me and Sean used to talk a lot about art and like his green drawings, I think I gravitate so much because you never knew what Sean was going to do next. And even the three that he just showed, each one were so different in subject matter and composition that I think it was exciting for me as a friend at that time because I'm like, I, you were just one of these artists that I, you're unexpected. I don't know what you're going to create next. And it was exciting. I think me as a, like a fan of art, uh, it's sometimes you can see when artists become very um, complex complacent yeah and like i do yeah. that from time to time too where things just feel very expected and then when you post a new piece of art no one's like wow it's more like okay mm -hmm. and i whenever i catch myself doing that i'm always like okay tim like let's let's step it up and i think for you it was weird because every single one i felt like you were stepping up this <laughs> level I of mystery and intrigue <laughs> so i i think i'll always look at your green drawings with such a passion because they were so much telling of the type of artist you can be and the type of artist uh, that I think does really well in the modern age because you don't just rely on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, no, I appreciate that. Really, mm -hmm. I do. It's, it's, and it's funny, like, I've learned to appreciate my green drawings a lot. I've, I've grown to, like, I remember at one point I was very resentful of them. You were. Yeah, I was very resentful of them because, like, they weren't technically this amazing thing. They weren't, you know, they didn't, maybe push what I was wanting to say or did that. But then every time I go back to them, every time I see them, I just, like, I always have a smile on my face, and I feel like it literally, as sappy as it sounds, I feel like it always, like, fills my heart of, like, what I want to do as an artist. Absolutely. And I got really far away from that. I feel like I'm slowly inching back that way, which I hope I am. Um, but, yeah. Then I ended up drawing things in brown. I drew these little tiny homes. They were kind of a lot of, uh, they were a lot of fun to do. They were just little things that I would explore. They were all inspired by House Moving Castle. I loved House Moving Castle, so I wanted to take little things and turn them into castles. Never heard of it. Never heard of it either, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but this was kind of a thing to where I remember doing these green drawings and, you know, stepping away from that. And I remember you would always ask me, like, you'd be like, oh, cool, you know, like, what's going on over here, over here? Um, the brown drawings still carry a lot of story with them, I think. Um, but I, I remember things just started to slip away. I don't know if it was because either I became lazy or I became complacent, like you said. I um, I don't think you're becoming complacent. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I always thought, because I was kind of doing something similar during this phase mm -hmm. as you, where I think we were getting scared of really pushing ourselves to oh, yeah. try new things. Because yeah. there's a vulnerability that no artist wants to subject themselves to. Mm -hmm. But I think those are the times when we really grow. I mean, this is so, you know, Hallmark reading card. But <laughs> it really does apply to artists so well. Uh, because you knew little, like, you would get good receptions to your bird or your mm -hmm. little home. So it's very mm -hmm. easy to want to recreate that same type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was this one, too, which I 
I really enjoyed the branches on it. I still look at this. I still look at these ones specifically for reference. <laughs> I reference something. I reference my own work. Ah, I do that too. Yeah, to where I'm just like, to where I'm like, how did I draw that? Like right here, I feel like has a lot of like just, yeah, just like a lot of swoosh and everything. I haven't, I, I feel like I haven't been able to, what? I just love when a sound effect can describe perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of swoosh. A lot of whoom. <laughs> a wave um but i love this piece i think it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. i really enjoyed it um you just understand bark you're really good at creating a texture with bark it's, bar it's just layers man that's all you got to do people are like hey how do you make that tree layers that's it. <laughs> um i love this little guy this is when i first showed you this is one of the first pieces i showed you yeah. yeah it was this little guy and i love him so much i love his little hat i love his little vest I love his little stick. I love his little everything. He's one of my favorites. He's like absolutely one of my favorites. His ears, I think, stand out to me. Mm-hmm. I just think he's a pretty not like a pretty solid silhouette. He's like, boop, he's a mouse. It's a good time. <laughs> I I did a thing though. Okay. So with David Peterson, you know David Peterson? You should have him on here. Mouse guard. Yeah, mouse guard, yeah. I should. Actually. Yeah, he's a good kid. Um I when I went to C2E2, I met him, and I showed him this, and I didn't know that you're, like, not supposed to do this or anything. I just really loved his work, so I showed him it, but what I said to him, I was like, can you, like, sign this page? That's what I said What's to him. this art? Like yeah, my thing! That's <laughs> <laughs> what I said. <laughs> Trying to charm your way through. Yeah. <laughs> it probably works, though. No! Well, like, he was, well, he was like... Uh, he wasn't like really feeling it at all. But then he went through he went through my sketchbook, and then he ended up like looking at me, and he went through my sketchbook again. And then after that, he asked, he's like, "Do you want to do a commission for me?" And so yeah, so my very first commission, like personal commission, was for David Peterson, um, which is awesome. Yeah, and I thought it was great, and I it blew my mind. And I saw him at Gen Con two years ago. And he came up to me and he was like, it looks like you're doing great. And I was still starstruck by him. I think he's wonderful. So Wait, could you imagine when you asked him to sign your mouse piece? <laughs> imagine if he's like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Pulls out, imagine he pulled out a giant black Sharpie and like covers the drum. Oh like, with his name. <laughs> it's like, this is what you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> David Peterson. <laughs> Here you go, kid. That will be $40. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is another one that I drew that I really loved. Um, Wait, wasn't this one before everything else? Yeah, these two were before, but they okay. were just out of order. I'm sorry. Um, but I really love this one, too. This was kind of like me. Just I love the Iron Giant. Actually, our uh, Alan Williams commented on this, and he was, like, really sad. And I asked him, I was like, well, what happened? And he's like, well, he took the kite away. <laughs> and I was like, well, no, he's giving it back. Like, she got it into the thing, and he was like, oh. It looks like he took it away. <laughs> it's like what he said to me. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you see what you see? Yeah, I guess. Um, but yeah, he. I feel like this robot, he's 51. Um, he kind of in influenced all the other ones, like this little guy right here as well. It's funny how much of an improvement you can see from this robot to, to the, uh, the circular one. The, the circular one. one. Yeah. Yeah. I still think this is one of your strongest pieces ever. I think so, too. There's so much about it that's so I good. peaked. I peaked, guys. <laughs> it's wow. all downhill. Yeah, here. downhill. Um, next one, two years ago. Uh, make them quick. Everybody knows them. Uh, this was one of the first blue and red pieces I did. Uh, I liked it. I showed our friend uh, Naomi Van Doren this piece, and she loved it. And she was like, you should really go this, this direction. I think it's great. Um, keep doing that. And I said, okay, thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, I ended up doing this. But this is when I was like starting to kind of go away from story and more focusing on composition and technicality of things, mm -hmm. rather than being like, okay, like. I mean, really, this looks like a great journal cover. Yeah, I could probably just put this on. You a could journal. easily slap this on a journal. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, same here. This one. Um, yeah, this is another one I drew. This one I remember was like my highest like picture on Instagram for the longest time. Um, it was one of those things I was looking at artists around this time. I was looking at artists of John Cooper and Tegan White, uh, and you can see like how those influences start to seep in of being like, okay, like I think these guys are wonderful. I want to be just like them. 
So you draw, you know, I mean, you draw what you admire, you know? And yeah, but once again, it was pushing away story and I, I'm really starting to get back into the phase of being like, no story is important. It needs to be. Um, this one's more recent. Uh, I actually know this one is two years ago because I drew it here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this one's kind of like the title thing for Beacon. I know that people, a lot of people kind of associate this one with my work. Uh, it's just a big old owl. This one a lot of people think is Harry Potter inspired, <laughs> which I didn't realize it. Uh, no, yeah, <laughs> which I didn't realize it, but it's an owl with a castle and a sword. Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah. Harry Potter, yeah. So a lot of people come up to uh, my booth and they'll be like, oh, is this Harry Potter? And I'll be like, yeah. Sounds like absolutely, absolutely. yes. Absolutely. If you love Harry Potter, you should buy this book. Buy it. <laughs> That's not what I say. This is Hedwig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's not what I say. But I appreciate it. Um, this one was also two years ago. I really enjoyed Beth Kavner's work, so I wanted to do more of like an homage to that, to where she had these beautiful sculpture shapes and everything, and trying to really capture that in my work and putting like a lot more structure and everything. But it's funny how I look at this piece and like the shading is everywhere. Like the light, the shading, every, everything is off, everything is silly. Um, but I don't know, I think it works. I think it's just more of a fun piece to look at rather than like a technically correct piece. Um, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> and then there's this one. Uh, and I really enjoy this one a lot too. It's going back to like the robots and everything. I think this one does have uh, this one does have a story in it. Um, I remember a lot of people ask me about this one, and they say, "Well, like, what's it about? Like, what's the meaning behind it?" And I normally just say, "Well, I'm really bad at Dark Souls, so <laughs> that's what, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of all it is." To where, but it's more or less uh, it's more along the lines of my sister and I. We used to play video games together, and I was always player two, and I always lost to my sister. And up here, there's a little player two thing. Um, and yeah, so it's just kind of like a nice little uh, thing of that. But That's I remember, cute. yeah, I remember doing these hands, and I remember something clicked in these hands to where I was like, okay, something's working with this piece, because I feel like these hands are, are, I don't know. Once again, I peaked. <laughs> you can't keep. <laughs> I peaked. I peaked two years ago. Um, and then now, uh, now my work's kind of all over the place. I feel like I'm back in this trying to find myself, trying to find this, trying to find that, what I like and what I don't like about my work. Um, so I recently did this one, uh, which was this big, big snake, um, and there's paper planes that run through it. Um, but it's not my favorite, I will say that. It's okay to not have favorites. Uh, this one was kind of just, I didn't really know what I was trying to do. I felt like I needed to, you know, kind of clock in, I guess, if you want to say that, yeah. We talk about that a lot. Yeah. And just being like, okay, cool, like, I, this is the piece I made, this is, I like these things, I like this flow thing, I like paper airplanes, I like castles, I like snakes. And that was it, there didn't really have a heart or soul or anything. Um, then I did this little guy. And I remember I scanned in one of my uh, pencils, and I followed along, I followed along this Cory Godby thing. For this one? Yeah, this Cory Godby tutorial. Um, and... I remember, like, he just he just broke down his colors and everything of how he did it, and I just followed along as slowly as I could. I built this one up very slow, and I made sure that everything sat correctly as much as possible. Um, and I love it. I This one is my all-time favorite piece thing that I've ever done. I think he has, like, a little story to him. He's just this nice little guy. He doesn't hurt anybody. He's Wait, don't hurt. say anything more. That's one of the questions. No. Oh, okay, great. Okay, we'll get back to it. Yeah, sure. Um... There's another one that I did. Is this this big piece? Um, I was kind of going. Oh, that looks so good on screen. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was kind of going back to uh, what made my green drawings my green drawings, and really trying to find that and trying to find this story. And I came up with this story of you had this little pilot guy, um, and he didn't know where he was going, so he was asking for directions from this rock golem. And obviously, it's a rock golem. But he's going to try and help him anyway. Oh. Yeah. What did you think it was? Rocks. No. <laughs> I thought he was holding a piece of paper for the plane to come get it. Nope. Nope. You could t I, can you zoom in on this? Uh, or the Z button? Yeah. 
Yeah, you can see oh. to where. So he's got little he's eyes. He's got the BMO face. Yeah, he's got a little BMO face. Or not BMO, Baymax. Yeah. Uh, he's got his little eyeballs, and he's like, where do I go? And then he gave him his, he gives him his little thing, and he's like, oh, maybe I'll tell oh. you. But yeah. So he's just asking for directions. And then the plane's just flying by. It probably should be parked, but it's just flying by. <laughs> 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 but um, I had a lot of fun with this one. I I ended up drawing it, and I didn't enjoy it while I was doing it because the whole time I mm -hmm. thought I was doing a very bad job. I didn't really know what I was trying to make. I didn't really know what I was trying to say, what I was trying to do. Um, luckily, while I was doing this one, I actually signed up for a small mentorship with Justin Gerard, and I got his opinions on all of this. And he actually helped me walk me through this one when it came to like th the technical aspects of it, like laying down color, where to put it, you know, uh, making sure things were too overly saturated, making sure your focal points were your focal points, all of that stuff. Um, and yeah, and he did a really great job in just helping me out and, and walk through that. Um, but yes, I the more I go back to this one, the more I just, I fall in love with it every time. I don't know why. It's just nice. I feel like it has a feeling to it. That's me being sappy. There's that. <laughs> um, I'll go over here. This is another little color experiment that I did. Same thing. Uh, I was kind of doing the same thing that I did with the little heart guy, but I took one of my bird drawings and wanted to color it and just make it kind of what it was, just try and do something with it. And it was funny because while I was doing this one, I was so convinced that I was using different colors. <laughs> and I was telling Tim and our friend Alex, and I was like, well, check it out. It's different. And you guys were like, it's still red and blue. <laughs> Your mama always, always calls. Always, always. calls. <laughs> just, but wait, she's going to call back again and like, 10 seconds <laughs> as if like I missed it. Oh, my, thanks God. Or I'm oh my goodness. Keep going, keep going. Um, <laughs> Always. But yeah, uh, so I ended up doing this piece and actually um, I asked our friend Dustin about this piece and Dustin said this is his favorite piece I've ever done. What? Yeah, and I was like, really? Why? And he's like, well, you use like this like greeny turquoise color that I put in my work all the time. I'm like, that's it? I was like, that's why you like it so much? Um, <laughs> Imagine if I was like, well, I like this one the best because it reminds me of me. Because it reminds me of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dustin. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to talk to him. No, but he he very much enjoyed this piece. I, I'm indifferent about it. Once again, it's one of those experiments. That I mean, it is through. strong. Like, the shape language is strong. Like, there's no one to dying. You got really fun shapes in the feathers and the tail feathers, especially. Mm. Uh, it's just one of those things where it's like you just experiment with your work and you just go through it. I will say, I do think that the coloring, like right through here, not here, here's a little maybe too saturated, but like right through like here, uh, it's really, really nice. I think everything just goes whoop. You know what I mean when I do that? <laughs> you guys know what I mean when you go like whoop and it just sits really nice? I mean, yeah. I think you're realizing the strength of like more muted colors. Mm -hmm. I think that's anyone that like gets into color theory. Well, you should know this because you went to tattoo, but they teach tattoo coloring way different than they illustration do. coloring. They do, yes. And that's something that I'm actually trying to get out of my head um, because tattoo coloring is very, very saturated. And a lot of black. A lot of black, a lot of white. Yeah, I, I'm learning that like using like white for things um, and using like white as like a highlight is just a, kind of a big no-no, I think, in his illustration, or at least from what I've been told. And yeah, not like pure white. It doesn't mean you can't use pure black or pure white, but if you're gonna use those colors, maybe like a really dark, slight color added gray, and then like a very light white with like a tint of a color depending on the scene. I think that's why this one worked out because there's very, like the brightest parts are like right here, and that's not white. That's like if you really go into it, you zoom. Yeah, I put blue in it. I put little bits of blue. There's not a little white right there. Well, and even, I know Justin Gerard does this a lot too. Like, you can see on the tail, because they can't see my finger, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, if you look here, <laughs> the, tail. Uh, the tail part, yeah, right there, it, instead of getting darker as it fades mm -hmm. out, it goes lighter. And it's that whole uh, receding, what's that called? 
atmospheric perspective. Yeah. Where, well, yeah, where it basically gets lighter the further it is away because there's more haze in the air atmosphere that yeah. creates that um, color desaturation. Oh, someone just said that the, that green bird is my WhatsApp wallpaper. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. I think that's a good thing. Thank you. You're right. It's um, better than their OnlyFans wallpaper. Better, yeah, much better. <laughs> um, there was this one that I did, uh, which was very, very recent. I cut off right here. There we go. Um, which is very, very recent. Uh, I wanted to not draw a bird. I wanted to. I was. I was going through something, and I just wanted to draw that out. Um, and yeah, and I ended up doing that. And I think with this piece specifically, I'm a little indifferent about it. But with this one specifically, I really enjoy. I think a lot of the shading and a lot of all the values sit really, really nice with each other. I think everybody's, or I think everything is actually fairly balanced. Not in a way of like, okay, like you have a good like round um, value scale, but when it comes to midtones and everything. I think the midtones are all very strong and they're all very prominent and they sit nice with each other. This piece to me screams very content, very at peace with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. It's not. It's not. But uh, I enjoy it. I think it was okay. It was a good. It was a good one for it. Well, I'm sure a lot of people even watching. You can tell like with Sean's work, it's always technically very strong. Like in your shading and your crispness in the way crisp. <laughs> Christmas. Crispness. <laughs> uh, your line weights are very strong. I think you just have this understanding of how to place um, certain elements in your pieces. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where, when we've been talking together about your future and what you want to do, it's not so much the technicality of art anymore, because you already have that. Now I think you're going back into like the storytelling elements, because that paired with your technicality, I think will be very strong. I hope so. That's literally what I'm trying to do. Uh, like all oh, they will be. Put it. <laughs> I like no doubts. I have zero doubts on that. Thanks. Um, and then there's this one that I did recently, and uh, I actually really I I like this one. This one has a special place in my heart, it's purely for what this what the story is behind it. It's Money. more yeah no, it's more of just a feeling. Um, but I used actually I used different pencils on this one. Uh, this was a collaboration with yes. Now I'm seeing how it looks. Oh, <laughs> this <laughs> was, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Yes. Uh, this was a yeah. This was a collaboration with Derwent uh, Color Pencils, and they gave me these new pencils to use, and it was uh, and it was really really wonderful. They blew my mind, uh, especially when it came to their texture and what they did and their saturation. It was insane. They just blasted through it. But besides that, um, I remember. When I was a kid, I used to go up to uh, our boat. We had a boat out in Lake Erie. It was a little, little tiny thing. Uh, it almost sank. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> um, but one of my favorite things to do is that when the water was like super calm and everything like that, I used to love just putting just the top of my hand just directly on the water. Not in the water, but like just on it. And there was a certain feeling to that that just made it feel just very nice, very calm. Um, and I want to capture that in this in this piece to where just a very just like, boop. Boop, boop. yes, and yeah, and then you just get a nice feeling out of it, uh, and yeah, and so I like this piece uh, all together. <laughs> it's funny. I feel like this whole presentation was like, do I like this piece? Do I not like this piece? <laughs> <laughs> and what? It's like 50-50? 50-50, Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Here, wait. Let me make our. Oh no! You know what? I'm gonna keep this antique here because the next couple questions, yeah. and then I'll let you pick the ones here. Yeah. So the next question is: What piece defined your growth and progress from seeing yourself as an amateur artist to a more professional one? Uh. And while you're picking it, I think even for those watching, usually as artists, we have a piece where we can usually hindsight look back and be like, "This is when I really grew," or at least. Maybe not even grow on a technical level, but even maybe your mindset set completely shifted into a different direction, and it was like a really good shift. So which one was that for you? I have two, I think. Oh, yeah. I think there's two. There's this one, this one specifically, which, yeah, okay. yeah, which this one was like just an understanding of good framing, good story, good where everything needs to go. Um, it just kind of just worked. Every everything in this piece was strong. Everything was there. It's like okay, boom. And I remember drawing it, and I felt very good about it. Um, 
but I still feel very good about it. And it really, really helped me boost in like a level of like, okay, like I can do this. Um, and then the second one was, uh, was this one. Um, I think that this one brought me, like this one got, this one got a lot of likes on Instagram, but I still felt very wonky about things. This one definitely defined the type of style I think that I do now. Um, everything's very clean, everything's very tight, everything's, you know, there's different colors being used. <laughs> well, there's a charm to Yeah, it. I feel like it shows more of your personality. Yeah, yeah, this one always I felt like had a soul compared to some other things that I've drawn. Um, this one just had a, had, a, had a thing behind it that just worked very well. And I like it a lot. This one definitely pushed me into that. Okay, like this is the blue and red that I do. This is the type of style that I do. I could, I feel you could look at this and you'd be able to pick me out, not in a, you know, not in like an egotistical sense, but like an artist lineup. I'm just like, okay, who did this? And then they got like, oh, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, it definitely helped define uh, a type of style that I do now. So yeah, I was like trying to make a witty joke, but I, I actually agree with you. I think in a lineup of artists, I can definitely pick yours out. If it was like a piece I've never seen before, I would be able to tell it's yours. Bad lighting. <laughs> what? Bad lighting. Yeah. No, you don't. Incorrect no. lighting. Get out of here. <laughs> uh, okay, the next one is, is there, going back to your heart piece, is there a piece you have a personal connection that stands amongst the rest as a personal favorite? Yeah. Yeah, it was the one that we were talking about. Uh, I named this one Heart, um, and I love it. I think it's just, it's very simple, but it was more of just how it looks, like, technically in everything. Everything sat where it was supposed to, even though, like, it's still, like, it was done traditionally, like, it still sits, you could still kind of see traditional elements with it. There was still a level of digital, and I was really proud of it because I felt like this was one of the very first times that I did something digitally and colored it digitally, which is something I'd like to do more of, that I felt was successful as compared to all of my other attempts to where it would just felt like, okay, I'm just splotching color on things. When this one had every color that sat nice with each other, it did a nice little gradient, but they were still pretty analogous from everything. Yeah, it was a good time. I very much enjoyed it. Yeah. I think it sat very well. I gave uh, this one out. This one was on my thank you cards. When people ordered my book, I just put my little thank you cards in it, and I put this little one. Oh, it was like a little postcard? Mm -hmm. You Actually, yeah, I, you didn't get one. You got say, go. I got socks. <laughs> yeah, you got socks. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I love those socks. <laughs> and actually, speaking of your book, now that I see it before we forget, Sean's book is actually available. There's a link. There's not a link below, but Tigil posted it. <laughs> Tigil did post it. Thank you, Tigil. You know why? I was I was remembering when I did the YouTube thing on Monday night, I couldn't find your shop on Etsy. And now I'm like, oh, because it was cool. Well, I found it, but there yeah. was nothing on it. I was like, did something happen? So now it makes sense. Yeah. Now my my Etsy shop was closed because I'm traveling everywhere. But since I'm go I'll be back next week, um, you'll be good to go. It's open. So yeah, if you guys, if anybody wants to pick up anything, go for it. Yeah, this is collection of works from what the last six and a half years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much everything. Yeah, and then in the back I have a uh, a little process overview that I do. Ooh. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, yeah, of how I do things. So if you want to do things like me. <laughs> Slowly. <laughs> that context, though. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, yes. Okay. So, going back into the questions, then. And for those of you who are joining, uh, if you have any questions for Sean, be sure to tag me so I can see it. And I'm adding it to the community questions. Actually, there are a few I missed that I'll add now. But while I'm adding those, the next question is, how do you hope people see your work? Let me go grab these. Mm. Um, I would hope that people... See a little bit of themselves in it, mm. uh, more or less because I know that as of late I've been really trying to chase feelings. I've been trying to define them. I know that Tim and I we have this uh, this fun dichotomy of you know you're the you're the hard hitting guy and I'm just the feely feely guy. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm the. Wait, what am I doing to people? <laughs> you're just the hard hitting guy. Yeah. We came up with the refrigerator thing together. If people know that, the fridge thing, where I remember saying that to where I would put it on the, my fridge. I would put everything on my fridge. Oh, yes. And you'd be like, no, nobody gets anything on the fridge. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I would really hope that people sees a little bit of themselves in my work, and I also really hope that people can find a little bit of like a little of le- little bit of like childlike wonder in a weird way. Um, like they can have a sense of escapism, which is something I'd like to chase after now. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing is just being able to relate to a feeling. They can look at something and they can feel something and reflect on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I missed so many. Okay. Next question would be, how do you balance the dual life of running a business and creating without monetary intention that's art purely for yourself? Um, I don't think I've balanced it very well, if I'm being honest. I think for a very long time I was purely focused on not monetary gain, but more of validation. Uh, more validation for my skills or more validation for like my technical things that I would do. Uh, yeah. And that's when you started seeing, like, you can see phases, especially in the book. Like, in the book goes through everything to where you have the green and then the brown and then the blue, and every one of those look different, you know? And they're growing. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, the, the work that I did is invalid or anything. Um, but, yeah, it uh, all of it turned into, you want to do art price? Um, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, all of it. Am I not on there? Oh my goodness! I'm I'll not even it. on the arc. I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it. Um, but yeah, uh, it was something that I took me a long time to really, really figure out. <laughs> where I want it. Where is your? Book? Where is it? Where is your book, Sean? Where is? Oh, it says. Did you mean? Are you typing it wrong? No, nope. oh, that's not it. Oh. Watches two click right here. Trying. Oh my goodness, that guy. I'm so sorry. There it is. It's not your fault. That's my lack of understanding how this works. Oh my goodness. There we go. It's an algorithm thing. Cool. Goodness me. I have terrible placement on Etsy. Oh, Andrew's here. Um, oh, hey, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Um, oh, and Corey. Hello, hello. Oh, hello. Corey. Ohio Brothers. There they are. The Ohio Brothers. Um, but yeah. I, where were we at? Oh, balancing the thing. It took me quite a bit. And honestly, I'm still balancing it. Uh, I'm still kind of focused on kind of focused on validation a bit. But now, since starting to realize of what truly, truly makes me happy as an artist, and really, really like brings that. How do I say it? There's like a sense of yeah. I mean, you can say like a sense of joy, essentially, of what you absolutely love in seeing in art rather than doing in art like not like technical things being like okay everything needs to be sharp everything needs to be this of what you like seeing in art mm-hmm. um that's what i'm starting to find is really important and that's starting to come back up and everything's now is starting to balance out well i think it's one of those things that uh it's hard to explain to people balancing business and creative mm-hmm. because i mean we talk about this all the time how it's like a balancing act and it's like a teeter-totter almost, or like a pendulum. And oftentimes you find yourself leaning more one side over the other. And when we're playing more of the business side, we call we call it playing the game. Mm-hmm. And it's hard when you're in that mindset to not see things more objectively with a price tag and how you can monetize it. Uh, and it's a difficult thing to, I think, pull out of because once you start seeing gains monetary in, yeah. in your financial income, yeah, it's hard not to want more of that. And I think that's where it's very easy to lose your way into that. And I, you know, I've struggled with that in the past years, Mm -hmm. but I think I've now found this balance and I think you were finding it, but I think for you, your focus really isn't monetary gain anyways right now. I think for you, it really is finding what direction your art's going in. So I think now you're leaning the other way, which is the creative side. Yeah. And I think I always tell artists, especially young ones, if you focus on quality in your work, Money is more of a byproduct, and you will see your financial income grow the more that you're more authentic in your work. And it's it's easy for me to say that, but it's another thing to experience it. So just know from artists that I've talked to, I'm sure you've talked to, it's the same story. Like yeah, Once you know. really start doing work that is yours and speaks to what you want to do, you'll see people uh, respond to that uh, in their wallet. <laughs> But more importantly, and I think as we get older too, mm-hmm. uh, there comes a certain point where that doesn't matter as much. No, I, it's like, 
there's a thing to where when you really ask yourself, especially like in the beginning, I know you and I, when it came to artists, like it was just like, mm-hmm. okay, we need to get some type of monetary gain. We need to pay rent. Yeah, we need to pay rent, we need to pay bills, we need to do that. Um, and obviously we still need to do that, but we've been able to, you know, put a pillow up or, or put a buffer and everything like that. And we're very grateful for that. So it's great uh, that we get to do this for a living. And I hope that you guys get to experience that as well. Um, but there is a point to where your oops. Uh, but there is a point. <laughs> but there is a point. The stream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're both slide out. Um, there's a point to where money doesn't drive you anymore. Um, and you, uh, honestly, I think at a, at a time you realize that. And I don't know if it hit you or anything like that, but I remember you got, or at least I got, I don't want to say sad, but it was more I felt lost, you know, to where you're just like, well, what do I make? How do I, or nothing felt like it was clicking. Nothing felt like it was doing it or uh, clicking with me Wait, personally. Ex- expunge upon this. So if you were essentially like you made pieces, it's like playing the game. And there comes a point to where you're like, what am I doing? You know, like, why am I not making oh. this yet? Why am I not doing the things I want to do? Why am mm-hmm. I not actually doing that? And it, as morbid as this sounds, now I'm to the point where I'll just ask myself, like, what do I actually want to do before I die? Um, what do I want to make? What do I want to see that I make? You know, not for anybody, but well, for me specifically. And I, know that I have a couple things in mind where I'm like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to do this. And there comes a point to where money just doesn't... I don't think money can ever replace any type of creative joy or uh, creative feeling that you get when it comes to making something that you absolutely love. Like that you just fall in love with. Oh, I feel like there's so much we could even tangent off of this discussion, but mm-hmm. you should repeat what you were saying in the kitchen to me this morning about... Okay, because you mentioned you have these projects, mm-hmm. but what was the thing you mentioned about keeping it more on oh, the DL? so <laughs> the backstory of it is my book was supposed to be released in 2016. Um, it was when was it released? It was, <laughs> it was released in 2020 uh, is when it was released. And it took me four years to put together a book because I just doubted myself the whole time. I didn't think I could make it. I didn't think I didn't have things were good enough and I talk about all that in the book um and the thing is though is that during that whole time that I lived with him is I would just talk about it I'd be like oh yeah like I'm making a book I'm doing this I'm making a book and nothing ever happened nothing ever came nothing ever this or I would draw something and Tim would ask like oh what's that for and I'm like it's for my book you know and it just still never happened um then you know last year COVID happened and I needed to get my button gear and I made a book. <laughs> I put the book together. I had all this work and I knew I didn't really know what I wanted to talk about and then finally I was like, what if I just talk about how it took me forever to make a book <laughs> and then I'll put all my artwork in it. Um and yeah, so now what I like to do though, it's I, I really try and keep my ideas close. I don't want to share them anymore. Um, I mean, I'll still share them if I get very excited about them or if I need feedback or anything, but to like really constantly talk about them is something that I don't think that you should be doing. I think that you should really, really put in like 80% of it and then be like, all right, this is what I'm doing. The last 20% should be like, all right, promoting, feedback, critique, Mm -hmm. uh, excitement, all of it, you know? And I feel like that was a lesson that our other roommate, Ashley Mm -hmm. Cloverkin on Instagram, uh, really talked about like not sharing things too early. Yeah. And I really agree with her because she talked about how you get a lot of the gratification mm-hmm. and like the pats on the back and like, oh, that's really cool. So all these compliments before anything's yeah. finished and then you already feel like you got what you needed from that idea. Mm-hmm. So for those watching, I would be, and like I we both shot ourselves in the foot with projects <laughs> that we tell way yeah. too early. And then it does kind of lose motivation to want to finish it. Yeah. Because you're already so excited about your other new ideas, but then it almost feels like an obligation to finish the first one because you've already told people. And uh, we kind of do define ourselves by uh, what we say. So when we don't follow through with what we say, it almost becomes like we're not even a trustworthy person then. Yeah. It like, affects yeah. so much of you, uh, especially with bigger projects. So keep them to yourself. I think Sean's learning that with his next thing we're not even going to say what it is <laughs> uh and 
I think that's a smart way to go about it. Yeah, no, just keep your ideas close. And also keep your ideas for yourself for a minute, you know? Yes. Like, because when you start giving your ideas away to other people, like, they might give you preemptive feedback, and it might change your vision of something that you actually, like, feel really passionate about. Uh, even if you're susceptible to the you know influence of what people say or critique or anything like that, you know if you know what something that you want to make or something that you just want to say and everything, mm -hmm. really really have that idea for you for the longest amount of time as you can, and then share it with the world. Agreed. Okay, so then our next question is: How do you overcome any art blocks that come your way, and how does art define who you become? Kind of two separate questions, but yeah. Um, so first one, how do you overcome any art blocks? I, I'm kind of on the same book of view of thinking that art blocks don't exist. Um, I, I think there's a time to where you feel unmotivated and you're afraid and scared of things. But like, I think with art block, like, yeah, yeah, that, that one happens too. Um, um, <laughs> um, um. But, like, when you start to, like, define, like, art block and what it actually is, I do think that you should really turn that telescope inward and be like, why am I blocked up? Why aren't I making something? Is it because I'm afraid? Is it because I think I'll fail? Is it because this? Is it because that? And then you kind of start to realize that the art block is not so much of a block, but rather more like a door, you know? And it's just something that you haven't gone through yet or something that you don't think that you can go through or anything like that um so yeah art blocks in a weird way like when i'm starting to feel unmotivated or anything like that it always goes to self-reflection and it's like why mm -hmm. why am i doing this yeah what was the next one uh how has art defined who you've become i'm just the blue and red guy <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I think without artist or without art or anything like that, I don't know. I mean, it's just I feel like it defines every part of me. It probably defines mm -hmm. every part of you. It brought everything that we've been able to experience as in life, you know, of doing uh, art and really, really like pushing ourselves and being as stubborn as possible, being like, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. And everything that just followed, I was able to meet you. I have a wonderful family with you guys. Um, you know, I was able to meet, uh, my girlfriend, Katie, who's wonderful. Uh, yeah, everything through art. I, it's, it's, I feel like it's, it's a really hard question to ask when it's just like, it's all of me, you know, like I absolutely adore it. I, I wouldn't want to do anything else. Yeah, I would agree with that. Is that a bad answer? Was that an okay answer? Yeah. Well, and even, <laughs> even with art blocks, but obviously we've talked a lot over mm -hmm. the past five six years mm -hmm. and whenever you do hit a piece where you're not really feeling it yeah uh, I think why people like to think that there are art blocks and the reason why I've adopted the idea that they don't exist is mm -hmm. because the more we tell ourselves that we're going through an art block the more that you're gonna hurdle through it yeah. and it won't be easy but I think a lot of the times it's just a lack of motivation and I think when you're on a piece that is a long time piece which I would say for you is a lot of your drawings where they take yeah. A long time and then when I do long pieces it's hard to have that consistent motivation from the beginning thumbnail to the final polish mm -hmm. and I think sometimes it's good for people to understand that while you're working on that piece if you're really not feeling what you're working on maybe put that temporarily on the back burner do mm -hmm. a small drawing and even if it's just like going outside and doing like a still life of a flower or an insect whatever it is do something where you break the chain of thinking on that piece because then when you come back to it, hopefully you'll find a little bit more uh, motivation to continue on. The worst thing that you can do is tell yourself that you're going through an art block or that you're not good enough. And I've been reading a lot about uh, the power of thought mm -hmm. and there's so much that we manifest by telling ourselves yeah. something. It's your vocabulary. A hundred percent. And especially if you, I, I cringe every time an artist says I'm not good enough. Because the more that you tell yourself, I say that all the time. I cringe. <laughs> <laughs> Some water right there. Oh yeah, but how many? Even when we go to cons, how many artists will we talk to where mm. they say like, "Oh, I'll never be this good," or blah blah blah? And I'm like, "Yes, you will. Just don't tell yourself that you won't." And I think I've been very privileged where I never really had people.
telling me I couldn't when I was in my younger years and very yeah. developmental years. So I always had a very headstrong, very bullish opinion of what I was capable of doing. And I didn't even have the, I couldn't draw something until I was in my college years. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that it was later because then I was able to maturely handle it and look at the situation with, you know, adult mind. But I think especially when we're kids or teenagers, mm -hmm. we cannot be telling ourselves that we're not good enough or that we can't. And those words are very destructive yeah. uh, over the passage of time. So, I uh, it's it's funny. My nephew, uh, he just went on this like huge tangent. He did this big old thing to where he went. <laughs> Wait, which one? Emmerich. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Where he did this big, big thing to where he told me this giant story of Legend of Zelda, and it was just off the cuff. And he was like, and then they went to this place and they fought this thing he like acted it out in front of me and everything oh. and it was great i was into it it was like hamlet i was like whoa this is a story um and then <laughs> i was really into it and the thing is is that after he told me everything and he like showed me and like all that i remember i sat there and i was like emrick i was like that was great i was like you really need to like not saying you need to like go up with it, go over that but Obviously, I know this is getting to like a weird parenting thing, but <laughs> <laughs> it's more of just, I wanted him to cultivate his imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and I really think that he did a good job doing that. And I think he should be praised for that because he spent so much time in his imagination and he shared his world with me. And I was like, this is great. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was into it. Encourage it. Yeah. No. Actually, quick side note. When I went to my brother's house, the oldest, uh, my oldest niece, she's like nine, mm -hmm. did a magic show for us. And it's like what you would expect from a nine-year-old. Yeah. But then my three-year-old niece decided during intermission that she wanted to do a trick. <laughs> so. I like how you had an intermission. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> she, she had to go upstairs to like read her magic book and yeah. then come back down with a trick. But during the intermission, my three, four-year-old niece, uh, she, there was a dollar trick. So then she decided she was going to do a magic trick. So the trick was she, my, my dad, her grandpa would yeah. give her a dollar and she's like, can I have a dollar? And then she literally goes, she like, stu like lifts her shirt all the way up, <laughs> sticks the dollar under, lowers the shirt and goes, where'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, I was dying. I think kids are so funny and their oh, imagination is so great. unfiltered. <laughs> that's yeah. I, it just reminded me of like a little kid doing something like it's oh so funny where to go and she'd be like where to go <laughs> the best part was though one time she stuck it too high it was like on her shoulder mm -hmm. so then when she went to reveal it was just like her belly <laughs> and then she's like then she was like questioning where it went like yeah. oh it was so great oh my god she's goodness. like did I make it disappear uh, okay here's a good one um, what is the best advice to an artist just starting out and then also what is the best advice to an artist struggling with where they're at so a newcomer and then someone that's you know been in the game for a while but struggling where they're at gotcha um i would say with a newcomer i would say really really get down to your fundamentals and be honest with your skills uh i think it's very good to admit to yourself if you're not good at something um not in the way that you like shame yourself of being like i'm not good enough and then you'll make him cringe um, he hears it from 200 miles away, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, Ooh, yeah. Oh, no. My spider sense. Self-deprecation. <laughs> yeah, and so... <laughs> no, depreciate. Or wait, is it deprecation? Deprecation, yeah. Oh, God, Tim. <laughs> Depreciation. <laughs> They're literally yeah. running away. They bought a car, and now it's worth less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did I put this yeah. on my taxes? Oh, their assets. They're just losing money. Anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> but it's become a liability. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, okay. Whew. All right. New artist, please be honest with yourself uh, in a very, very constructive way. If you know you're not good at something, admit that you're not good at it and learn to be better at it. Um, you know, it's one of those things to where you can keep going and find trusted people that can that you can critique. Uh, a lot of people can get through on mom comments, is what I call them, where you know you show your parents something, you show your mom something, and they're like, "Wow, this is amazing." You know, mm -hmm. and those are great because it's your mom, and I hope that you all love your mothers. Um, but at the same time, they're not helpful, I guess, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it's one of those things to where it's like, okay, like, I need to be honest. I need to know, like, where my skills are, and I need to know where I want to go. Uh, please be honest with yourself is basically what it is. What's that whiplash 
Um, not the my, worst thing. Not my tempo. I, <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing you can tell someone is good job. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. You know, because, like, when you tell somebody good job, it doesn't, I don't know, it, it maybe it feels with you, but it doesn't sit no, with me. No. It's, it's one of those things to where it's like, well, I know that you have, there has to be some type of opinion. Someone has a preference. And I'm not trying to, like, rip, like, a critique out of them and be like, all right, rip my work apart. But everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a preference. You know, it's mm-hmm. kind of just one of those things to where it's like, hey, like, I, what do you truly think about this? You know, what do you like? What don't you like? Not just good job. Yeah, and don't do self-critiques that are like, I'm really bad at yeah. not giving myself 110% on every project. It's like, <laughs> is that really being self, you know, reflective? Self, Yeah, self-critiques are hard because it's like they can go into shaming and then you end up shaming yourself. Uh, I do it all the time. The, uh, big time I, I did it uh, to where I would look at something and I'd be like, oh, well, this isn't good enough and then you die. And then, <sighs> yeah. But I didn't give myself a reason. There was no honest behind it. There was no honesty behind it. It was just kind of a flat surface level like, I'm not good enough, and I didn't know why, because I didn't ask why. Yeah, and don't be the artist that clearly is just fishing for compliments, because sometimes artists that are really good will say, oh, no, it's terrible, or, oh, no, it sucks. I think mm-hmm. because they want that reassurance that, no, it is good. Yeah. Uh, but you're almost putting yourself in a position where it's more difficult to grow, because you've already set the standard, like, well, this is a whole tangent. I feel like I can, we can talk about I guess about it's that funny because this this gets into the difference between you and I to where you're the hard-hitting guy and then I'm also the feelings guy. To where I will say, mm-hmm. like, there are times to where you feel bad and you can't do anything about it. It's like an emotional faucet. I don't know if you've... It's what I've said to where it's an emotional faucet to where you turn it on and then those things just keep coming <laughs> right. out. I don't think I've heard this before. You've never heard that? Emotional faucet. It's an emotional faucet to where some days you just have the faucet and it's just running. Does that mean my well's dry? <laughs> No, not if you're just running. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, here's a better example. The difference is if someone says, oh, I think this is really bad, yeah. I'll then, instead of be like, oh, no, it's really good, like, oh, no, or like, oh, here we go, I'll be say, <laughs> well, what about it is bad? Yes. I'll yes. make them say what they think constructively is bad, or objectively mm-hmm. is bad, and kind of have them self-constructively critique themselves. Yeah. Uh, because me being like, uh, you're, you're fine, what does that do? It almost invalidates me as uh, like a mentor because then I'm not giving anything helpful. Mm. But I also don't know how people take critique. I'm very careful about who I give critique to. Yeah. Because yeah. I've learned like people like you can definitely take it. There's other people where I learned it can destroy them for like a week because, you know, someone that maybe they admire doesn't think they're good enough, mm-hmm. which is not the direction I don't think any artist wants to. Um, do when giving critique. Also, Rosemary just wanted to answer her question about the mic. Um, yeah, the mic's being a little silly, so I apologize. I think it's because it's connecting to my new Mac. I am, I am really sorry about that, guys. This is my second time streaming with it, so I didn't know that this was going to be an issue, but I'll probably hook up my old computer for future streams. Mm-hmm. I'll have to bring you back at some point. Yeah. yeah. We'll bring you back in January. We'll just redo it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, and then the other one was how, what advice do you have to an artist struggling at where they're at? Oh, uh, go back to about go back to what you love about art. Mm. Yeah, it's always that. Go back to what made you fall in love with art. Um, I love that, Drea. I do. I just, <laughs> I just need a emotional bombing. I do. Yeah, me too. Um, but yeah, it's always it, it's you go back to the things that you love. Um, you know, it's, if you know that you're struggling with something, if something doesn't feel like it's like, oh no, like, I I don't know why this isn't working. I don't know why I'm not getting the satisfaction or fulfillment. Um, really, really go back and say like, what brought me to this place to begin with? Like, why did I want to get into art? Why did I want to do that? I, I feel like once a year, I always fall back into just looking at Justin Gerard's work, looking at Corey Godby's work and just absolutely falling in love with it. Just falling in love with so much fantasy, so much story, so much, and even just older, even older illustrations. I'm like falling in yeah. love with like vintage like illustrations of like Arthur Rackham and the all late of, 1600s. Yeah, yeah, like all of those. Like they're so beautiful. Um, 
and it's always just you just refill your inspiration with things that you used to love you know you go back to it and you just find those things and then you just try and draw those things try and capture those feelings uh in your work and i think that is one of the best things that you can do for yourself as in a self-healing thing this is something that alex said um to where i think you know a project like that can be very self-healing and it's something that you don't have to share you don't need to share everything on instagram you know it does, these are things that you can just mm-hmm. they're for you and that's why you love them so yeah and it's so hard when we're conditioned to share everything mm-hmm. nowadays mm-hmm. and i i feel like we could even do i'd almost love to bring alex on for us to do like a triple stream talking about why modern arts triple stream is terrible <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, it, it, there's so much of a fast-paced mentality where it's very, uh, I mean, inauthentic such a vague word, but it doesn't feel like it's from the heart. It feels very much clocking in. It feels very spit-painted mm-hmm. and very much like I have, I am on a schedule where I have to post once every other day. Define modern art. Like, what do you... I consider, okay, and I'm not going to try to sound like I'm working on digital artists, but I would say from early, like mid-2000s till now, mm-hmm. I would consider modern art. And I think it's the digital era, which I've kind of termed to be the commercialism era of art, where everything now has a price tag. Everything has a purpose besides uh, creating from a place of yourself. Mm. That was like, uh, it's the whole, Marina Abramovic talked about, uh, to be an artist is like breathing. It's something that just comes naturally. You, You know if you're an artist is if you, have to create work mm. all the time and it doesn't mean like every day you're working 18 hours but it means there's usually ideas forming in your mind while you're just out and about yeah, your day and definitely you put it on paper so that's an artist but nowadays and like i said i would love to do a triple stream with you me alex because i think we have a lot of thoughts on why that has shifted the past decade a lot of different thoughts too as well like i mean it, I, I i don't want it to be like an echo chamber like while we're just here and we're like oh, oh no. yeah oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah 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 i agree oh yeah well the I three agree. of us i think do disagree on a lot of art um matters but i think we respect each other enough to have like a, a conversation about it mm-hmm. and I, I would be very curious to hear you and alex <laughs> three 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 um give thoughts on this because i think a lot of people that come to my streams or even i mean my youtube channel is very small but like on instagram between the three of us we see a lot of the users that really grow versus the ones who are static versus how social media has even influenced what they did back in my day day. day. when there was just graphite and wood back in my day when instagram was chronological (laughs) yeah (laughs) uh anyways this is another thing but Let's keep moving on so we can get to the community questions here. Because I feel like we can just jammer for Blab hours. and blab. One of my favorite parts about a friendship. Uh, what advice would you give about being authentic in your work? Ooh. Um, Alex and I have had talks about this. And this goes back to really... Re- it's You're able to read yourself, kind of, in a weird way. Um, it's the only way I know how to put it. It goes back to that emotional. Wait, so that again? Being able to being able to read yourself. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so it's kind of like what you said. And when you're working on something, you ask yourself a question: Is this working? Is this not working? But mm. then you want to go even deeper than that, and you really, really. It, it, this is very sound sappy. It very sounds poetic. I've been reading a lot of poetry, and <laughs> it's just something to where you need to be able to feel what your heart saying um you know and you need to be able to just feel that as much as possible Jim hurts yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> um and as you're working and the things that like really really bring that feeling out really bring that feeling of i loved this like this feels like me this feels like something that mm-hmm. that i want to create this feels like something i want to go after it's always reading yourself it's always self-reflection while you're working um yeah and it's always just feeling what your heart is saying to be as authentic as possible like that's why i go back to this drawing you know of just this little thing that's why i named it heart because it was just something to where i loved it and i loved every part of it and everything worked and i named it after i'd made it um and i was like yeah i was like this is just something that i felt like was a part of me and now it's on the page and i can look at it 
it feels like me, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's how it becomes authentic to where it's you just you find those things that truly make you happy. There's other sound, you know, there, there, there's things that I've been asking myself lately to where what makes me happy. And it doesn't matter, like, if it's as, like, abstract or anything like that. Like, one of my favorite things that makes me happy is the sound of sticks popping in a fire. Mm. And it's just like, psh, 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 like those quick things. But they, I love it. I don't know why. But it brings me this feeling of, like, actual joy of, like, oh, my goodness. Like, this is a wonderful feeling. Same with that feeling of placing my hand onto the water. Like, that's something that's just for me. You know, it's all these little feelings that you have to where you're just like, okay, these are just for me. And if you're able to really, really take symbolism, take stories, take anything like that and relate them and put them on a piece of paper in a creative way, then you'll always be authentic. I totally agree. Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, final question before we get to the community questions is more of a personal question for me to you. How do you work despite when you're feeling in a head funk? When you're, when you're, what did, what did Rhea say? Your emotional plumbing needs fixing? Yeah, so like, let's <laughs> say you need to have work done, but your basement is flooded. Yeah, my basement is flooded. Oh, wait, no, that's a different meaning. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, your emotional plumbing is backed up, we'll say. Mm. But, and in your case, I know you've experienced this last year a little bit when cons were cut short because of COVID, mm-hmm. where money all of a sudden became more of a prevalent issue. Mm-hmm. So before the handouts started coming out. <laughs> <laughs> before the handouts. <laughs> but there was a worry. There, yeah, there was a, like, a terrible worry. And it was more of a fear of thinking that this was going to be taken away from me. Um, of thinking like, oh no, like now that the world has changed, I'm not going to be able to make art again or anything. Um, and that was a really, really hard feeling to work through. And the only way that I was able to work through that was uh, just go through it very slowly and be able to read yourself, to learn how to read yourself even more. I know I just keep using that as an example, but I really do believe that like every year you should go through it at least like a day of self-reflection of where you are, who you are, what you want to do, who you want like you know who you want to be what what are things that you like to say everything like that you know you really should be self-reflecting don't do it all the time because then you'll be you know some existential stuff and you'll be like oh no i'm losing my mind um, yeah, you're like, you hi-fi nothing really matters yeah like, you know what <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna pull back yeah you end up starting to fall into nihilism but uh-huh. yeah um no it's just something to where it's it goes even further to where it's like, okay, in those little moments of having that head funk and even that, and this is something that I've learned from hanging out with you and Alex, of just knowing what makes me happy and what makes me uh, what makes me go. And also, another thing too, going back to like the art block thing, mm-hmm. I know that a lot of people have a hard time starting. I have a very hard time starting on things. Even if it's something that I've been working on for a while, it's hard for me to actually sit and work on it. But when you get to a point to when you're drawing and something, everything like melts away. Everything flows out of what, like everything just... The zone. Yeah, you are just you just get basically get into a flow state. Um, That's what it's called, the flow. Yeah, and there's like no greater feeling than that feeling, I think, especially when you're like really into a drawing and when you're just getting down to the nitty gritty of it and even that drawing that i showed you uh the one that i'm working on Mm -hmm. um like you zoomed in and you saw like all the details and everything i put into it and i put these little tiny little thingies in there and there and there and there and i was just having fun i was like look at this i was like i'm gonna put a little fishing rod here i'm gonna put a little chest right here that you put his little stuff in you know but it's like that's you basically you're creating a story for yourself you're living in your world um and being able to first learn about who you are as a person and what makes you happy, even if it's something as strange as sticks popping in a fire. Yeah. You know, like even if it's something as silly as that, it doesn't matter. That's still what makes you happy. And I remember Alex told something. It was, I remember showing you birds and everything. And I remember Alex said, I want you to like the fact that you love drawing birds, is what he said to me. He's like, because I like that about you. And he's like, do you like that about you? (laughs) And it really made me reflect as much as possible to where it was like, oh, like, I do like that. I like drawing birds because 
there's these fun shapes that they are, and I can exaggerate these wings, and like they're just really nice things to look at. Birds are nice. Birds are pretty. Um, well, the meaning of birds, I would say they do represent like freedom and. Yeah, but I mean, I know I draw them more because they're pretty. I like looking at them. But when I think of you, I don't see you as a person that feels rooted to like a location. I feel like you always have a sense of adventure in you, which I don't know. Oh, maybe I'm nice. looking at this too much, oh, but like nice. subconsciously, maybe that's where birds. That's something I would like to portray. So I feel like works, you do. Yeah. But I know you said you don't have a hard time starting a project, but I guess for the viewing audience, do you have a hard time finishing? <laughs> No, I feel like I'm very, I'm, I can finish, it, it's starting. Starting is the thing. I have a hard time starting. So you have no problems finishing? No. No, no, no. <laughs> I can finish as fast as possible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm very slow. Um, but uh, starting, it's always sitting down. It's that fear of just being like, well, this is going to be good enough for the uh, Instagram. This is not going to be good for Instagram. This isn't going to be that. It's having all of those <laughs> you're right no no keep going keep going <laughs> um yeah it's all those pictures of uh instagram or anything that like this just isn't gonna fit and then that's all those thoughts so you're already creating little hurdles that you have to jump over before you actually sit down and work on your stuff so, i'm gonna yeah. deep dive subconscious here sure do you think part of why starting is difficult is because then you're locked into this idea where I think a lot of when I think of you mm. and what you enjoy is more free, is more free. As soon as you lock in an idea, it becomes hard to like commit to it because then you almost block yourself from thinking of new things. That's how that book. That's uh, that's how that was made because I wanted it to be a specific idea. But as I started to grow as an artist and as I started to want to do things as an artist, like things just started changing. You know, uh, you know, my work started changing. The things I like to think the the influences that I looked at all started changing like nothing just sat um with itself and I think if that's just a personality trait or if that's just something about you then I think that you should just work with that and that should just be what your stuff is you know obviously like there's a still sense of consistency that I think I found within my work um you know it's not like all over the place like style wise um but yeah it's, it's the sense of like what you how am I putting this? I'm starting to go. I'm starting to lose my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to lose my train of thought. Yeah. <laughs> I don't you stop. <laughs> I don't remember where I was going with that. I literally lost my train of thought. Oh the my destination goodness. was somewhere over here, and you're like, yeah. mm. well, it looks like I can't finish, guys. So. <laughs> Okay, well, let's get into the community questions, and we can kind of go from there. Um, so if any of you have more questions, I know there are some that I'll pick up as well, but uh, now is the time for you to ask your questions that you want Sean to answer, and he'll mm -hmm. do his best to answer them. And to start off, one of the first ones we had from Drea was, what kind of stories do you want to tell with your art? Smile uh, face emoji. Now, I'd like to tell stories that are all kind of very human-based. Um, but in more of like a bird's body, yeah, a bit more of like a fantasy, a bit more like a fantasy thing to where I remember I wanted to tell a story or I don't want to say I remember, that's silly. Um, I'd like to tell stories that relate to, uh, very human feelings, you know, whether it be a feeling of rejection, whether it be a feeling of being very happy about something, whether it be a feeling of comparing yourself or having a day where you just cry all day or having a day where you feel like you're on top of the world you know anything that you can just just as a human I mean everything that you experience I think that the best thing that you can do is to take that feeling to take maybe this kind of uh, ordinary feeling or something like that something just for you and to really exaggerate it in like a fantasy Thing. You can really blow it up and find some type of escapism and wonder in it. So really, I guess the whole thing is what kind of story do you want to tell? Is anything that gives you a sense of escapism, or wonder, or freedom, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. So then, going forward, Antonios is asking, how do you keep yourself motivated? I come home from work and all I want to do is lay down and turn into melted butter. That sounds nice. Um, just being butter for a bit. Can you ever imagine? Anyway. Um, 
Um, keeping yourself motivated is in a sense of knowing that if, I don't know, I have this thing to where if I don't make something, I feel like I'm going to implode on myself. Mm -hmm. um, it's the fact of like these things need to come out. I know, um, you mean Mondays? You mean Mondays? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, these feelings just have to come out. They just need to. So when it comes to being motivated in a technical way, rather than giving you the emotion answer, in the mm. technical way of thinking it, it's give yourself the small goal of being like, okay, I have this drawing in front of me. I only have this amount of time. Give yourself a goal. Be like, all right, I want to get this section done. I want to get this section done. I want to get this section done. And you hold yourself to that. And then you can even get a thing to where it's, I think it's either like a little calendar, but then they make one to where it's like a little light box calendar that if you, yeah, if you end up doing what you need to do the day, you press the button and it makes a light. And then the same thing that you have the light so you can see it. and you can see your progress. So yeah, I think tracking your progress is a really good way to keep you motivated, but don't shame yourself, um, but track your progress. Agreed. I, I know what helps. I used to do a thing where I would try to like draw a sketch every morning as like a warm up, mm -hmm. but then I realized if I hated the warm up, I felt like I failed. So instead, I learned from this YouTube video instead of tracking what you objectively do, just track your time. So yeah. you'd be like, I put one hour into a warm up sketch, I put one hour into this. And that way, when you look at what you did for the day, you can look at how much time you invested into your path which I think can be more encouraging than looking at the end results because some drawings, as we know, might take 40 plus hours. Mm -hmm. So on that day, maybe you only did like an inch by inch square and you're like, oh God, I'm so slow or I'm so bad or I'm so inefficient that it becomes hard to stay motivated through that. But if you look at your day and be like, wow, I put eight hours. I mean, if you put eight hours into an inch by inch square, I mean, yeah, maybe try to speed it up a little bit. Hey, more. That's, you can do that. That's fine. <laughs> You know what's funny is I've been doing that recently, and I think of you, because on my last tarot card, I was doing this, uh, uh, pff, what's that thing you sit on a throne? Mm -hmm. And the part behind her collectively took like 18 hours. I'm like, this is the slowest I felt. <laughs> and I, I know what you mean now when you say like you guilt yourself or like you shame yourself for it. Mm -hmm. And I normally never do that. So it was very weird stepping into that mindset where I was like, I am slow. And I need to like do something about it. Yeah, I hate yeah. that feeling. That's so with me because I draw bigger than you, and so mm -hmm. when it comes to that, I really just track it in sections. Like I said, to where I look at it and I'm like, okay, I know how slow I am. I know how I work. I'm going to get this section done. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's going to be bigger than an inch by inch. I don't don't do an inch by inch. Push yourself. <laughs> you know, um, and yeah. So it's always like, okay, I'm going to get this section done, I'm going to get this section done, and then just build up from there. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, track your progress. Yeah, I think that will definitely keep you motivated. And if you do have a 9 to 5, like what you're mentioning, I think it's easy if you just start small. Try doing like a half hour a day or an hour a day. And that hour leads into 7 a week if you're consistent, and that could lead into 28, 30 hours a month, and you'd be amazed at how much you can accomplish. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing, though, is try to stay off of technology I yeah think phones yeah Netflix phones. binging uh you know what actually you'll like this i think uh someone made a mention of all these gen z kids and all these uh late millennials uh post all the time on twitter on facebook on uh, facebook tiktok on instagram and if you collectively took all the time and effort they put into writing those posts in one year they could write a book mm -hmm. and i thought about that i was like you know that's so true. How many people do we know that spend a lot of time and energy writing really well-worded posts? And if you look at them, it's like a two-paragraph, three-paragraph. So if you collect all of them, yeah. that could legit be a novel. But since we're putting our energy into the wrong medium, we don't have an output anymore. Our output is like social gain, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, rather than having like a physical product that you worked on. I had a uh, illustration teacher and he ended up saying if he notices that his friends are like posting a lot he knows that they're not working <laughs> and so it's yeah uh, that's one thing you kind of know i mean you you have a schedule like you have like a posting schedule you integrate your posting yeah. into your work yeah right here yeah like calendar you in you integrate it into your work yeah it's all down that row um which is fine but 
I mean, you'll have times to where, like, I mean, if you wake up and you're just sitting and scrolling on Instagram or anything like that, you know, like, what, mm-hmm. you kind of got to, you really have to go back and ask yourself, like, what could I have done with this time, you know, and know your time, you know, I'm not trying to, you're not trying to say, like, okay, you need to stay up, you know, for however many hours, if you have a nine to five, obviously that's a priority in your life. Yeah. Um, if you have this amount of time, commit to it as much as possible. And it's something that we, I know you've probably seen a little bit with even our new roommate, Deandra. She mm-hmm. really wants to get into the art world. And I tell her like, okay, if you're serious about that, then you're committing to, you have to work some kind of social game yeah. because you want eyes on what you create. So if you want to get into social media, specifically Instagram, you do kind of have to play by their rules if you want to gain traction on there. It doesn't, it shouldn't dictate what you draw, but it should kind of influence how you post, even if it's a lot of work in progress, a lot of, you know, quick captures. So just be aware that that takes time. So instead of scrolling or like looking on Twitter for hours or like even Pinterest, I get caught in that trap a lot. Mm-hmm. Take that time and invest in yourself rather than investing in uh, browsing, essentially. Yeah. Okay, this next one's from Jonathan Liddell, one of our favorites. It says, Sean, great to catch you guys. So, senior price. Has the past <laughs> week, while. Well, I think baby. he meant <laughs> past wee while. Oh, okay, past wee, wee while. while been beneficial. He's Scottish. <laughs> Even types in Scottish. Even types in Scottish. Uh, has what a guy. Been- <laughs> beneficial in rediscovering the art you want to make absolutely yes absolutely moving on we got <laughs> no i'm kidding you can talk no 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 absolutely it's one of those things to where i mean i just showed you something but i'm still being very choosy about what i show people things mm-hmm. now and i uh i think it's one of those things to where if i need to really ask myself like do i want to make this does this make me happy it's basically a maria Kondo. does this bring me joy you know and if mm-hmm. it, yeah, and if it does, then I'm going to make it, and I will commit to it, and I will make it into something that I want to make, like at, you know, the best abilities that I can. So yes, it's it's the past wee while has been a great time. Yeah. <laughs> Next one's from Tijol, wonderful, wonderful mind. Hi, Tijol. Tijol says, "Hey, Sean, I'm still wondering what the backstory is behind the piece I bought from you." Which one was that? Oh, yeah, he bought, um, I didn't put it up here, but oh. he, well, do I have my phone, or do you have your phone? Oh, yeah, we can just do that. We have this wonderful novel. We have this. Which one is this? It's in the green. Nope, 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 other way, other way, other way, that one. Uh, he bought this one from me. Um, yeah, it was a green drawing, and so this was actually something that I drew when I was getting out of tattooing, and I looked at my, I, I considered myself as, I don't want to say I considered myself, but the way I was able to kind of put a symbolism thing behind it is that I thought of what you love and who you are and everything like that is a house, you're a little house, um, and... Basically, it was something to where I was having terrible, I was having terrible thoughts. I was like, once again, doubting myself. My emotional plumbing was wrecked uh, during that time and didn't know what to do. And so I wanted to create these things, these kind of these, these demonic things where they were trying to take over this thing. Uh, and they just couldn't because this house was so rooted down to uh, this cliffside of being like, no, like, I truly believe in what I need to do and who I want to be as a person that you cannot take this from me. And so as much as they try and take it and everything like that, and as silly and as silly as they are and as scary as they are, they don't take it. So yeah. I love your green drawings. <laughs> <laughs> Each one has such a unique story. All right, next one is from Lars. It says, you seem to be working on a single purse for a piece for a relatively long time. I do. Has it ever happened to that you got sick of a piece before you were able to finish it if so how did you get past it um i think it's very important to finish everything you start uh mm. so there are pieces like even if i do something and i don't post it there's been i think two or three pieces that i never finished um but for the most part everything i do is is mostly just like okay like i finish this i finish this i finish this i finish this posting it is a different matter but um just making sure that you finish it 
Uh, and I do get sick of it sometimes. Like that one piece I showed you earlier with the snake and the castles and all of that. Um, the snake and the castle and the paper planes and everything like that. I got very sick of that piece because I was I was dragging my feet on it. Um, I wasn't doing uh, I wasn't doing anything to kind of. It wasn't really pushing me. I didn't really like it, but I knew that I needed to finish it. And that really stuck in my mind of just the importance of finishing something rather than just being like, okay, like this is the best thing I've drawn in the world and everything. It just turned into, I need to finish this and then I can move on. But that's my morality of it. I, I really do think that finishing is important um, as compared to maybe something to where Tim would be like, okay, put this on the back burner put this on that if something is really 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 not working um then i don't do it uh then i just yeah I, I won't do it i won't work on it or anything like that but for the most part i will do everything i can yeah everything i can to uh to finish something and to make it work make it work tim gunn <laughs> uh the next one is from Sapiedra. says, do you think mastery of art is a feeling that many artists aspire? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely I do. I think, uh, but I think now there's a lot of things that go into art rather than just technicalities of things, you know. Um, <laughs> rather than just technicalities of things. Uh, I think there's, things like what we were talking about there's story that you can put in you know there can be artists out there who are not the best artists but they have a beautiful imagination and how they just put things out and you're just so enamored by it like you can master story in within art you can master composition within art you can master everything like that um i don't think i don't think everybody will be able to master all of it all at once but I do think that people have strengths, and I think what you know your strengths are, those ones are just going to naturally grow as you progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, especially nowadays, I mean, we talked about too about how some artists are more entertainers. Yeah. And it's not necessarily that they do bad art, it's just their focus isn't having like this technical, creative, original masterpiece of each piece. It's the process of making it, trying to have it be fun and relatable for people watching, mm. which is a very new way of going about creating work uh, that wasn't even relevant 20, 30 years ago because we didn't have internet uh, capabilities like we do now. We don't have YouTube and TikTok and all these ways that culture is definitely shifting yeah. how we approach art. And it's it's really difficult not to get swept into that. Mm. Like even when TikTok really started getting big and then Instagram added Reels, how many of us especially from our age group, we're mm -hmm. like, okay, well, we have to learn it. Then. We have to somehow adapt what our process is to include it uh, and do our best not to let it change what we create. Yeah. But I think a lot of people then almost change what they create to fit the medium. Absolutely. So, I, yeah, mastery of art is a very interesting concept nowadays. It is. It really is because there's so many things about it, you know. Um, not to say that, you know, it's it's – super vague but yeah there's just a lot of things that i feel like you can definitely master within it you know and if you're thinking about like mastering everything i don't know if people can do that you know i feel like there's always going to be like i mean there's definitely artists out there that you can look at and be like wow those people are perfect but you'll only know yeah you'll only know or they they will only know what their faults are and yeah it's 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 not a bad thing to be it's not a bad thing to be not that great in something because you can always get better in it. This is another one of those topics we could usually have a three 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 conversation yeah. on. Uh because even I think how people perceive not to expunge on this further, but how people perceive mastering art, I think nowadays is defined by your follower count Absolutely. and how much money you make. Absolutely. Which yeah. is a travesty. Mm -hmm. Considering some of the best artists, especially when Instagram was a little younger. Some of the best artists I knew, like back in the day, even the Gerards, a lot of them like barely had any followers. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, they deserve so much more. And I would get almost like defensive of them. Mm -hmm. And obviously I was younger and I was like, oh, they deserve so much more than so-and-so artists. And I was very like comparative. Yeah. Uh, and I realized, you know, if, at some point you realize it doesn't actually matter. But unfortunately, it has such a 
power has such an influence to people that don't know you. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say this, but I'm sure you've done this before. Maybe, maybe not. Where like you'll be talking to someone, like even at a farmer's market, I'll be talking to someone. And then if they ask me what I do, I'll show them my Instagram page. Mm. And immediately their tone shifts where it's like, oh, you're actually good at art. Or, yeah. Oh, you're actually yeah. doing it. And it's so much. It's so funny how just a number can influence people so much. It's very strange, man. I don't know why they put it. This is actually a good question from Sharta. Um, I, I don't mean to skip questions. But yeah. No, this totally but it's goes like what along we're the same about. lines. Yeah, what we're talking about. Here else. Well, we'll jump right into it. So Sharta is asking, do you feel like mastering social media nowadays is a part of mastering art or being an artist? I say no. I don't think no at all. I think, I think social media is a completely different hat. And you invest a lot of time into your social media. I don't. Um, and so, you know, but like I was able to garner an audience back when it was, I honestly want to say maybe it was a little bit easier to garner an audience on Instagram. Well, yeah. It's, yeah. Every year it comes harder. Yeah. And now it's, you know, uh, I was able to do cons and everything like that and having everything out there, word of mouth, like just being, having people there just follow you like right at the show and everything, being able to do that. Um, but no, I think being social media is a completely different presentation. And I think that that's something that there's an art to it, but I wouldn't say that it has anything to do with being an artist. Yeah, I have to almost reread this question in my mind. Do you feel like mastering social media is a part of mastering art or being an artist? I would say I agree with what you're saying. I think like mm -hmm. in pure art, absolutely not. But I think rather than wording it as being an artist, I think it's being uh, a business. A business. Yeah, like, a like an art business. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I think yeah, there's so many contradictions in my head right now because I agree with everything Sean just said, but I think in terms of a business sense, mm -hmm. nowadays it's so easy to just to be an artist in your house and not even have to like go anywhere. I mean, you can do Patreon, YouTube. There um, are a lot of outlets. There's, there's quite, so, quite a bit. So many outlets. So being a modern artist is the easiest it's ever been. And we're really quick, really quick. And I think the level of quality, no offense, has dipped over the past 10 years where it's easier to get ahead because, uh, unfortunately, everyone's so conditioned to fast-paced things that yeah. the artists that really take their time on creating work has kind of just slowly dipped, I think, over the past 10 years. And I think becoming uh, seen on social media, it becomes harder every day because mm -hmm. people join Instagram every day. So it does become harder. The yeah. algorithm does kind of favor those that are already doing kind of well. Trends. Trends. Yeah. So it is an uphill battle for sure. And that's why I think when people. we talk to younger artists. <laughs> people. Uh, <laughs> we don't need to get into Choice that. words. Choice yeah. words. Uh, <laughs> respect what everyone does. You know, yeah. Everyone does different craft. Um, but I do think when we talk to younger artists, it's very focused on, you know, focus on quality, mm -hmm. do not focus on numbers, do not focus on financial gain, because yeah. that is a byproduct. And I try to reinforce that every time I talk to a young artist that seems to be struggling with that, Yeah. because how can that not be so a part of their thought process when they're 17, when we didn't have that at 17? Nope. So we got to kind of skate through our development years, like really focusing on the foundations, and then I didn't even have social media account until I was like 22, 23. And I didn't even have Instagram until I was like 20. You didn't have MySpace? No. I had MySpace. Well, yeah, but when you think about that, that's more for personal relations. But yeah, it wasn't anything like, like, for like your here's art? my art, here's my thing, here's this. That wasn't even a thing. Yeah, when was your first art account? I think mine was DeviantArt. Like maybe. Mine was DeviantArt. DeviantArt probably 2012. Yeah, that sounds right. Something, yeah. I was yeah. 22. And I feel like that then bled into Facebook pages. Yeah. And then eventually that bled into Instagram, which has become kind of the, the big one alongside kind of TikTok, but mostly Instagram, I would say, is the dominant one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Next one. Good question, though. Good. Very good question. And that's another one I would love to have a mm -hmm. triple conversation with Alex on. Uh, if you guys don't know who Alex is, Alex Dos Dias is one of our other close friends. We do like a weekly gathering where triple. we talk about art. And we have some really good discussions. And like what you said, we don't always agree with each other. Actually, a lot of the times we're like arguing with each other. I think it, 
<laughs> well, I think it's great because it's like I feel like you have. We even do this thing to where even now to where it's this. Uh, the social media thing you put a lot of work into it mm-hmm. I've stopped to put work into it because it doesn't bring me joy and so I've stopped and then you still work on it and then Alex in the middle would be like why and he would ask us both yeah it's a very good like he's a very good balance mediator yeah yeah, yeah. what I think because you overthink things I would say I don't think about things <laughs> enough and then he's somewhere in the middle I would say quite a bit okay next questions from Veronica or Veronica says, "What is your advice on drawing from imagination?" Um. Oh, I don't even know. Like, is it like from like in like a technical aspect or in a like what you want to see or how would you interpret this question? Yeah, let me reword this for you. Like technically. Yeah, I guess there would be uh, two stages to this. Mm-hmm. I think the technical aspects of the imagination and then two, gathering something that's more abstract in maybe thinking and how to turn that into an objective form. Mm, okay. So I guess first do the technical because I think we both are on the same page with that one. Yeah, the technical one is just building up a vocabulary of what you know how to draw. That's all the study and fundamentals mm-hmm. and being able to see what you draw. Um, so like, let's say if you're looking at like a bunches of leaves or like you do this on your streams and everything where you do your draw alongs. Mm-hmm. All of your draw alongs are teaching somebody how to draw. Um, and you do a really, really good job with that to where when you did your crystals, you were like, these are these shapes. These Besides are these the shapes. technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, so once you start kind of do that, and then in like when you're starting to think of something like imagine, you know, let's say you're imagining a boat. Um, and so you think of a boat and you're like, okay, well, how do I want this boat to look? Then I would go and I would gather reference, and I gather two things of reference. One is I gather reference of realism, and then the other one is I gather reference of just artistic reference, the things that look really nice, things that I res- like, things that resonate. Um, and I'll try and marry those as much as possible to where it's like, okay, I need the believability of a boat, but I also want the stylization of these artists I look up to or things that feel natural to me. Um, and yeah, and that's kind of something that you, the more you do it, the more you kind of do that. I think what you should do is is kind of uh, studies to where, you know, let's take just leaves or something like that. Do a reference study of a leaf, then get rid of all your reference and be like, okay, here's how I want to draw a leaf, you know, and just kind of go from there. And then you'll start to develop styles. You'll start to look at other things. Just be a sponge as much as possible when it comes to building your uh, imagination and building like what you love about it. Um, what was the other one? The other one was how to translate things. Is that what you were saying? So imagine you have like the idea of, I want to put on the page being feeling trapped in a mind prison. How do you objectively take that thought and create a visual that represents that thought? Okay, so that goes into being able to read yourself. And it's the fact of what does that actually make you feel like? So if you feel like mm-hmm. if it's something to where you're like, okay, I feel trapped then put yourself even further into that like what does that even feel like does that feel cold to you does it feel warm does it feel like overly hot does it feel this i know that i've had a thing to where um been writing poetry and uh there's things that were reflecting on that of something how you feel inside i remember talking about or i remember writing about something that there's a furnace inside of you um you know and that furnace and then you start to imagine it what that furnace actually is is it rusty? Is it like, does it hurt like and everything? Does it hurt when you think about it? Everything, you know, and you take all of those and then you start to connect those to a symbolism. You start to connect those to visual elements of what does that make you feel like? You know, okay, when I think of cold, what does it make you think of? Does it make you think of this? Does it make you think of this? A lot of my bird drawings are all kind of, uh, they're all metaphors of emotions, you know, um, drawing that bird. And, and it was the only way of just kind of, being able to to I don't know why for some reason that that feels more natural to me rather than drawing humans or anything like that drawing birds or animals or anything just feels way more natural than a human um I don't know why uh but yeah even that you know it's always like this meta of being like how does that make me feel what does that make me think of what is this and you take those symbols and just toss them onto the page and marry them together and even going further on that, yeah, yes and. Yes and. <laughs> uh, like, let's say, when you say, what do 
you think of when you think of pain. Everyone's going to have a different, mm -hmm. maybe even physical object. Like for me, needles would be pain. So if I'm going to depict feeling pain in an art piece, I might show a very jagged point or a very mm -hmm. like, you know, needle-like shape. Wow, I didn't think shape. of that. I didn't think of needles. I thought of a burn. See? Yeah. And what's great is everyone associates different feelings with different usually objects in the real world. And then depicting that, you'll find other people that also relate to this very niche association with a word or a feeling and that's where you get these connections where you bridge the gap between how people uh, think about the world yep. around us yep well Liz, uh, there was another example i had in my head too. even with that even with that drawing that we showed that tidjal had like thinking of yourself and thinking everything that you love is a small house you know mm -hmm. like rather than thinking of like that just felt natural to me of being like this represents everything i love this represents a family this represents my friends everything you know that i want to do and these things are trying to take this away from me you know um and yeah you just suck everything up as 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 uh what is it you just suck everything up as a sponge yes and <laughs> yes and <laughs> uh i i'm thinking about uh too when they say any advice on drawing for imagination the other thing that I think you do do is uh, drawing without any reference. And sometimes you'll mm -hmm. be amazed at how you think things look or how things flow together yeah. before yeah. you start looking at the actual representation. Mm -hmm. And I think a good, like the good challenge uh, we've done before is drawing animals. Drawing animals without blinds, reference. Which it's very interesting to see how you interpret it without a reference. And I know... I don't necessarily recommend this, but I've definitely done this in the car before where I'll draw, uh, in my mind I'll think of like shapes, but I'll draw without looking at the page. Mm -hmm. And then when I like scribble for a while, I'll then look down and then I'll kind of see what I, it was meant to be. Yeah. And then it'll be fun to extract those shapes into something new because it's so unbiased from your influence of how things really look. Um, yes, and <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I love clouds. As a kid, I've always loved clouds. Um, but rather than just looking at a cloud and being like, that looks like a bunny, that looks like this, that looks like that, I remember being a kid and I wanted to make scenes. I wanted them to be scenes as it, to where like whether there was like big dragons flying through and there were boats next to it and everything like that. And I think that's actually a lot of where my work comes from, where it's kind of collage you know? You had those paper planes just randomly flying around things and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's something to where that was something I always loved as a kid, and I think also when it comes to your imagination is kind of really connect with that kid again, I guess, inside of you um, of being like, okay, like this is what I did when I was, and I would always imagine this as a kid and go back to those memories and find what you, basically find what you loved about them. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. I've drawn a bunch of things from clouds. I, I've taken pictures of clouds. I'm just like, that looks like this. I'm drawing it. I honestly think taking reference photos in your your real life oh yes yeah. way to oh, yeah. reference it's great it's great because then you can you can i mean you completely control it you can see what you want and everything that i just took i remember i just took a picture of it was just a what the hell is your background a duck oh yeah <laughs> it's a duck it's a close-up of a duck's beak yeah um yeah i have found these i found these are oh, cicada. yeah this is a cicada shell you can show it yeah um yeah these cicada shells and where is it? There it is. And they were absolutely beautiful. I didn't know you. Were, I thought you were doing that one. Never mind. I know. Surprisingly, this camera is better than that one. Oh my goodness! Not. Yeah. But I took like so much. There was so much. There's this too. You can capture angles. You can get angles and everything. Look at that. Look at those colors. That little thing just like bronze, like yeah. a copper. It was beautiful. Um, another thing too, when we were uh, traveling around, there was these are tops of clouds. This Ooh. is like a beautiful color palette of like my. Color and sent this to me. Um, what else we got in here? Oh yeah, there's this. I just love this scene. This was in North Carolina. I was just standing by a, yeah, I was just standing by a river. And it was beautiful. <laughs> it was green everywhere. Great. It was wonderful. Um, well, and when, if, you in, if you incorporate it into your work, mm -hmm. it's very unique to you. <laughs> just this little house. I like this. That's all I liked. And so I was like, okay. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that. all the time. <laughs> How many times do you take a picture of something but only like like the little small oh, yeah. aspect of it? I went to uh, Duke. Duke um, 
university because Kay's brother is there for grad school, and it's the most beautiful college I've ever been to. It was built in like the 1800s, and it's amazing. It's beautiful. But I, I walked through all of it, and all I did was grab this little part because I just love that shape. Actually, that is like a shape. And I was like, that's beautiful. And it's coming off of, like, there's, yeah, what it's just coming thing. off of the weird things. And then they had these griffins. They had these built into there, and they were these griffins, and it was all for, like, this alchemy, alchemy thing. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It was beautiful. And I was like, holy moly, this is a good rock. <laughs> and even talking about when you were mentioning the boat idea, mm -hmm. uh, the the quote that I think of from Corey Godby is, look at your idea like a prism. Yeah. So yeah. what... Like, if you're thinking boat, where is this boat. boat normally traveling on? If it's a salt water uh, body that it's usually traveling on, not like a fresh water, then maybe you'll have more of the crusty sides on the boat and more of the, um, you know, weather damage that would be on it. And then you have to think of the different parts of the boat. Like, why would this be here? Where does an anchor normally go on a boat? Uh, and it's kind of fun because you learn more about boats the more research you do. And then when you put that into your work, it feels more thought out it feels like a fully realized boat even if it's an imaginative one. Oh, Shartha wants the shape <laughs> right. everyone also wants to yeah. see your duck oh they want to see my duck all right um yeah so the shape that's literally like, just the shape it's just in the middle of this brick thing and it's beautiful it looks like a house for a robin or something but like a regal robin <laughs> right yeah it's like a yeah where's your duck bag don't even worry about it I have a lot of, this is my... He has a folder just of ducks. I have a lot of work in progress pictures in here. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah, you weren't kidding. Yeah. Where is my duck? Don't, keep going. Keep, don't do just, oh. yeah, don't do ah. this air time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like looking through your phone scrolling. Uh, but I do think when you draw from imagination, I know that's something that I, I would say I do more than I don't. <gasps> Look at these buddies. Oh gosh. Anyway. <laughs> Those are cute. Those are more like Pokemon poses. Uh, I find that I try to create shit. I, I enjoy my art the most when it, it grows organically on itself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been very difficult. I, I talked to Sean and Alex about this, how doing the tarot series, it's very uh, pre-composed in a sense because I'm following the original deck so closely. Oh, well, thank you, Cyro, for subscribing. But because I'm doing that, the creative part is kind of done in terms of composition and the elements that you include and it's like up to you to take that and make it even more original but that's so opposite of my normal way of going about art so it's been difficult and uh that's why when you ask that question i do feel like i do better going from imagination and then kind of laying things out and letting it grow mm -hmm. uh, but every artist is going to work differently and i know me you and actually, a lot of our friends, we all have a very different process. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's very important to say is don't commit to one wholeheartedly because you'll find that as you get older, your process will shift usually a little bit. It'll change. Mm -hmm. Or you might do dramatic changes along the way. And I think uh, not only accepting that that will happen, but going with the flow rather than resisting it will help you because the more you resist the natural change of going in down an art direction Absolutely. will only inhibit your art. Oh, okay, here's the duck. Here's the duck, everyone. Uh, this <laughs> is my this is my background of my phone. It's just a duck. Um, that was an email. Sorry, that was my credit card email. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, but it has your social number on but it. That's, yeah, but that's the background of my duck. The reason it's that is because I found this on an Instagram. It was like a duck. He's just a duck on Instagram, and I love him. I don't remember the Instagram, I'm sorry. Oh, but you love them. <laughs> well, you no. Know, he used the words, I guess. Um, but anyway, so they just took this picture of him on Instagram, and then I cropped it, and I remember just sitting there, and I was just laughing to myself, and it made me so happy that I made it my background. So now it's my background forever. <laughs> See? I legit could not tell what that was at a quick glance. I was like, <laughs> what the hell is your background? <laughs> Okay, but anyways, that was our questions. Thank you guys all for coming to this interview stream. Even though we had a little bit of an audio issue, this was actually a really fun stream. Uh, I know definitely some good questions. I feel like you guys definitely Solid. were asking questions that uh, weren't to surface, which is great because I think diving deeper into the, the well of art, uh, you can always pull some fun things out. So thank you all for coming to this live stream. Uh, I'm sure we'll have Sean back at some point. 
Like I said, I would love to do one with the three of us at some point. We'll somehow figure that. <laughs> Still not Tedril. Donated one. I love the voice. <laughs> well, thank you, definitely not Tishel, whoever you may be. Whoever that was. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, Sean, do you have any final words? Just be nice. And if you want to yeah. follow Sean, <laughs> yeah. I have links to his Instagram below, and I posted. I'm going to post your Etsy one more time. Yeah. And then, oops. Oh, what? Oh. Oh. Eh. Let's just redo that really quick. I'll post it in there. Uh, but thank you guys for coming. Oh yeah, thank you actually everybody who used to see Tim and I on these streams a bunch. All the old viewers and everything like that. It was wonderful. I had a great time being back on. It was good to see you guys and everything. It's very nice. Yeah, good little I still Yeah, I still recognize all the names. It's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming, and hopefully we'll see you next time.